Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning again. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. I got attention. <laughs> it's a very um, exciting time for us to. Uh, we're hearing from from uh, Alan Roebuck before, during, and after the presentation. So, if you just for a minute, so thank you. Um, uh, to have an exciting time where we, we get to hear the the new fellows and what they're up to. And uh, the first speaker is an old old friend of mine who I met when I was a student, and 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 Michael was a postdoc at MIT, and uh, we've bumped into each other ever since. And uh, Michael is besides excellent science is, is, a, is a personality in his own right, and, and I mean that in a very, very positive manner. And uh, so we look forward to hearing from large-scale atmospheric dynamics, a major paradigm change with a solar spin-off. Michael. Uh, I understand that. That might be beyond our expertise. <laughs> we should turn the lights down. Oh, dynamics. Uh, Light. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, that doesn't work. Hey, it was going to take some time. Now you, you don't you worry about it. We'll uh, light. No. Well, it says light on the box, but when you turn the, or twist the thing, nothing happens. It's a Gatesian user interface. <laughs> you have to turn the lights. Uh, okay, we're told, as this is going to be videoed uh, and it's going to go out on the web, you can see up there, uh, that they need the lights. So, eyes wide open. Well, um, <laughs> at my advanced age, I think I'm allowed a little nostalgia. So I thought it might be fun to take a look back to see just how far we've come since I was a postdoc at MIT with Peter here um, under Jewel Charney in the late 1960s. And I can't even, uh, I can't really say it all in the time available. So if you're interested in the tortuous history, there's more about it on my web page. In particular, section one of this paper I wrote with David Dritchell after the Jets and Annular Structure meeting, the Chapman Con Conference at Savannah, um, where I noticed that um, some of the older things that had been discovered were, had been forgotten. Anyway, um, so this will be very sketchy, this talk, necessarily. And, and um, if you want to find my web page, all you need to do is to do a Google search on the exact phrase, lucidity principles. If you search the Michael McIntyre, you'll find dozens where, where two a penny in the world. Um, the solar spin-off, uh, I don't really have time to do justice to that either, but let me just say what the problem um, was. Um, the, through the marvels of helioseismic technology, the rotational splitting of the sun's acoustic modes very precisely observed, we can back out the differential rotation of the sun. This is angular velocity, um, and we find that the, there's no significant evidence for departures from solid rotation in the sun's interior. And at, when this was first discovered, this was a great surprise for reasons that I hope to uh, <coughs> lightly touch on at least. But um, this is the problem. You've got solid rotation in the interior, strong differential rotation here in the convection zone, and uh, uh, a tight shear layer separating the two. We call it the taco Klein, the sudden speed change. And uh, the problem is to understand why that doesn't spread down into the interior, as you might guess at first. Now, I'm going to leave that hanging, but I'll say a little bit at the end of the talk how that connects with what we've learned about the Earth's atmosphere. Now, um, paradigm changes. History reminds us that science is always a struggle with unconscious assumptions. And here's um, another, here's an example of the fact that we all, we all make them. Um, in case you didn't see it, 12 moving points. Everyone with normal vision sees a person walking. Unconscious assumptions are involved. The brain is fitting a model to, the, to those data 
uh, in which there's a certain set of assumptions, Bayesian priors, if you will, uh, in favor of a certain kind of piecewise, rigid, three-dimensional motion. It's not trivial. They could be fireflies, but we'd, nobody sees them that way. Um, and of course, so-called paradigm changes involve exposing, very often, unconscious assumptions that are wrong. Um, now, my favorite list is quite long, but here are a few of them from the time span of my career. I'll, I'll call the first the energetics assumption, um, which is the assumption that studying energy budgets is the answer to everything. This was quite prevalent when I was a young scientist. I think many people know better these days. Um, but of course, you can easily think of counterexamples. Um, uh, the amp an ordinary electronic amplifier is a good one. If you did nothing but study the energy budget of an electronic amplifier, you would think that everything uh, hung on the power supply and that the input signal was quite unimportant. Um, and, of course, related is the small is unimportant assumption, which we, uh, which we uh, often encounter in public debates on climate change. Let me just uh, quickly mention that I think a nice way to think about the climate problem is to say that the Earth's climate system is an amplifier, um, albeit one with a horribly slow response from the human, on human timescales. It's a slow responding amplifier and its input signals are, well, over the past million years or so, it's very clear that one of them is small orbital changes, changes in the Earth's orbit about the Sun, changes in tilt of the axis and so on. Um, but another input signal is injection of carbon dioxide. Why does it make sense to call that an input signal? It's because carbon dioxide is uh, extremely stable chemically. Most other carbon compounds in the atmosphere end up as carbon dioxide. Um, and, um, it's the, and it's non-condensing. Uh, Andrew Lasis, one of my fellow electees, made this point very well in science last year. Carbon dioxide is the most important non-condensing greenhouse gas for the Earth. And, and that's something we should all get into the habit of repeating, I think, to ward off these silly arguments that water vapor is on the same footing rather than being an internal feedback mediating variable. Um, so thinking of amplifiers helps us with that kind of problem. Um, but this talk is more centered around a couple of other assumptions that um, are, I think, more or less finished with, although the second version still seems to kick around, especially in ocean turbulence, and I'll be saying something about in, that in tomorrow's talk in the ocean science section on ocean jets. Well, let, let's Look at this one, the eddy viscosity assumption. This is um, pretty much finished with now, but in the first half of the 20th century, it was quite standard. A famous meteorologist called Albert Defant said, right, the atmosphere has a very large Reynolds number, and that means it's, of course, highly turbulent, and that means, of course, it has an eddy viscosity. And so when Victor Starr found that if you made that kind of ansatz, and uh, had to admit that the viscosity values had to be negative, it was a great puzzle. Um, it related to the assumption that homogeneous turbulence theory correctly guides you because um, eddy viscosities come from uh, the simplest forms of homogeneous turbulence theory. And, and this is central to the talk because it's here that we have the biggest paradigm changes, not just for the Earth, but then subsequently for the Sun, because solar physicists, some even today, rather believe in the eddy viscosity assumption and think that that's why the Sun's interior is in solid rotation, because the viscosity, of course, drives the system toward solid rotation. Um, now, as regards that assumption for the Earth, the change was very gradual. Um, the history was long and tortuous. There was no Einstein moment, I think, when everything suddenly became clear. But you could say that today we do have a crystal clear understanding of this issue, and that it began with the work of my mentor, Jewel Charney, God rest his soul, and um, Bob Dickinson, who was another contemporary of ours at MIT, 
um, who made a contribution that I think was seminal and has been largely forgotten, and that was one of the point, points in our historical review. Now, you can summarize the paradigm change succinctly by saying this, okay, when I was a postdoc, you had Victor Starr's book on negative viscosity, you also had Edward Lorenz's book on the general circulation, that is the Ed Lorenz, the father of chaos theory, a most lucid and profound thinker, and his book said that um, the uh, negative viscosity observed by Starr, and, and incidentally adumbrated by Harold Jeffries many decades before, that made no sense. Um, it, it was a complete and utter mystery. Both Lorenz and Starr said in their books, we haven't the slightest clue why you should get upgraded momentum transport. So that's the old paradigm. Now you can say it's been replaced by what I like to call the radiation stress dominated atmosphere. Uh, radiation stress, that's the language of physics, which I like to think in. That means wave induced momentum transport. That's the dominant effect when you view the atmosphere on a large scale. And it's often anti-frictional. It's no longer a mystery that you should see upgradient momentum transports in some locations. And the accompanying insight is that there's no such thing as turbulence without waves. Um, and I should add that you um, can't describe any of this using homogeneous turbulence theory. Um, and you can regard this whole thing as an example of one of the grand themes of physics, the dynamical organization of fluctuations with systematic mean effects. Um, another example is molecular motors. If I raise a heavy weight, uh, the thermal fluctuations are being dynamically organized by some clever molecules in here with systematic mean effects. But in the atmosphere, what organizes the fluctuations is wave propagation mechanisms. And the simplest example is the famous plum McEwen experiment. I think probably everybody knows of that. How do I click on that? that um, Ah, it's that mouse. I got the wrong mouse here. I got the rat, not the mouse. Uh, whoops. Um, uh, everybody knows this, but it's a beautiful demonstration of Kyoto University. You're looking into the side of a big annulus full of stratified flow. You do nothing. Here's the bottom line. You are drive it away from solid rotation by nothing more than the imposition of fluctuations at its top boundary which then get organized by the gravity wave propagation mechanism and modified by the shear flow that develops. There's what you see at early times, nothing but internal gravity waves generated by this boundary, but at, at le long, later times speeded up. In, you, you see this shear flow, which is just like the quasi-biennial oscillation in the Earth's equatorial stratosphere with a reversal in the start of every 13 months or so, in the lab every few hours. Um, and, but the key point is this dynamical organization by the wave propagation uh, mechanism. Uh, I lost the button. Oh, it's, it's this one. Yep, there we go. Um, incidentally, there's a beautiful, uh, this, this gets us into the territory of wave mean interaction theory, and I would regard that as kind of basic to understanding most of these problems, and there's a beautiful new book about it by my colleague Oliver Bühler at the Courant Institute, which I, heart, I strongly recommend to anyone who wants to understand this on a more technical level, because um, you can see where non-acceleration theorems come from and all that kind of thing. Um, in the case of the QBO, what you basically got is wave propagation and shearing of waves, and you can, with simple internal gravity waves, you can see immediately there's a systematic correlation between the vertical and horizontal velocity fields that transports momentum over long distances, um, limited only by the distances over which the wave can propagate, and that's fundamentally the point. Now, um, these ideas uh, explain not only the star negative viscosity enigma and the QBO, but also the enigma of 
the Noctilucent Clouds, which was the third great enigma that I encountered when I was a postdoc at MIT. The, the fact that the sunniest place on Earth is as cold as place on Earth, the cold summer mesopause at 80-something kilometers. These are these beautiful Noctilucent Clouds hanging out at altitudes of 83 to 84 kilometers, characteristic electric blue color due to the Shapwee absorption light coming through the ozone layer. How am I doing for time? Okay. Um, now, um, I'm going to sort of cut through a little bit. It, it, it's not a radiative to photochemical mystery as people thought when I was young. It's just the result of long-range momentum transport by these same internal gravity waves, an anti-frictional force field driving a mean meridional circulation through a mechanical gyroscopic pumping action, as I like to call it. And this was not understood when I was, none of this was understood when I was a postdoc. It wasn't understood that waves are absorbed, let alone the dynamics of gyroscopic pumping. In fact, circulations of this kind were regarded as thermally driven. And uh, this you can see in very many of the papers over the decades from then, um, and including the stratospheric Brewer-Dobson circulation and and circulations in time inside solar type stars. Um, what do they look like? Here's a rather nostalgic old transparency of mine. It's too busy to go through, but here's the Brewer-Dobson circulation backed out for in infrared radiometry in space by Solomon et al. back in 1986. Still one of the iconic pictures. I think you have rising motion in the tropics. Here's the Murgatroyd Singleton circulation with the upwelling that accounts for the noctilucent clouds. This is a giant refrigerator. You, you supply water vapor. You've got to do that, otherwise it would all be photolyzed up there by lime and alpha and so forth. It's the coldest place on Earth outside cold, low temperature labs. Um, and uh, this has been independently verified by the so-called tape recorder, the recording of a seasonal cycle of water vapor fluctuations in the rising tropics um, with nice uh, chemical tracer techniques from the UR's satellite. So, so the observations are, the observational picture has been clear for a long time. This is quite old results, of course, that are very well known. But um, why were these circulations regarded as thermally driven? Since I'm interested in concepts and mechanisms, uh, it bothers me because it never made sense. And I think it's actually an example of another unconscious assumption that needs adding to my list. Well, here's my list. Um, I'm going to call this the A equals B assumption. Um, and this is obviously unconscious because the moment you make it conscious, it, you can see that it's stupid. An equation A equals B means that B causes A as if it were a line of computer code. I think sometimes there's a conflation between equations and lines of computer code because we all, we're all immersed in computer codes these days, aren't we? Um, and you may well laugh, but I, my reply is I've seen this assumption very many times in different contexts. Here's another example. If you have a pressure field and the large scale flow is in geostrophic balance, you, you uh, have a link between pressure gradient and, and wind speed, the geostrophic relation. And, and um, I've often seen, you can see this in many, many published papers. Ah, we have a pressure field. This causes the wind field. And it's like saying that if you whirl a weight around your head like this, the tension in the string causes the circular motion. Yes, well, it doesn't, of course. It's just a diagnostic link. Um, once you make this conscious, you can see that it's all a bit stupid. Now, um, the context of interest here is the, uh, where A is the, is the thermal, thermodynamic equation, yes, um, where B is the heating rate and A is something, something proportional to the vertical velocity to good approximation when you express that velocity in suitable coordinates. I've, I've lost the laser point, pointer. What do you see what I do with the laser pointer? Oh, here it is. OK. Um, so that's the A equals B in this case. And now I'm going to skip that slide. I don't have time for it. But the bottom line is that's what, OK, you might ask, why can't I prescribe the heating rate? What's wrong with the thought experiment where I prescribe the heating rate? Well, the answer is that it's, it's um, Prescribing the heating rate is stupid because um, the heating rate is in a relaxation. It's a thermally relaxing system. That applies to the middle atmosphere, the stratosphere, and the sun's interior. So uh, uh, 
it's, it's, it's like prescribing the friction when you push a weight along a table. Uh, so it's a bad thought experiment. Uh, and of course, what uh, that's been replaced by is this idea of gyroscopic pumping. It's, the standard term is wave driving, but I like a self-explanatory term. You've got a rapidly rotating system, the Rossby number's low, so the Coriolis effects are strong. If you have a systematic, say, westward force, then Coriolis effects want to turn this pole, and so you've got a mechanical pump, for heaven's sake. It's just like Ekman pumping. The only difference is that here you have a wave-induced force due to breaking Rossby waves, actually, mostly, or gravity waves if you're higher up. Um, in the Ekman case, the force is due to friction, but everything else is the same. You pump stuff toward the rotation axis if the force is retrograde. How am I doing for time? We're done already. OK. Well, I won't talk about downward control. I won't talk about potential vorticity which is the clue to understanding how Rossby waves work, but that's in my tomorrow's talk anyway. But I'll just leave up. And there's this beautiful tale of Bretherton identity which says if you mix potential vorticity, then you inevitably have upgraded momentum fluxes. It's a, it's, it's a beautiful, powerful result that should be flagged up in all the textbooks uh, because it's valid at any amplitude for forced free, any geostrophic motion. There's an example of, here's an example of the, the real atmosphere doing it through the wonders of modern weather forecasting technology. And I will leave up my slide on the solar problem for you to read and uh, pursue further if you're interested. Thanks for listening. Uh, well, we have a question or two. I, I do have one tiny story to tell. And I was visiting uh, University of Reading, I think it was. Uh, many years ago, this is now probably 20 years ago, and I hadn't seen Michael for a while, but I, I noticed he had a young woman trapped underneath the stairs. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and he was... What a thing to say. Well, it, it was true. <laughs> it turned out, it, it turned out uh, uh, Tim Palmer's wife, you remember Tim is a, also a sort of a chaos through a nemesis. And, uh, and I walked past and I heard the words, but you must get your husband to consider potential vorticity more deeply. So there. <laughs> That's true. Story. Well, Tim didn't really need persuading. He got it pretty quickly. I know, I know, I know. It's, a, it's the story. Uh, time for a question or two. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good example. Yeah. <laughs> Time for one more question. Yes. Oh, I wouldn't dismiss radiation. I just note that it is relaxational process, especially when you view it on a large scale for this sort of purpose. Hmm. Very important, of course. Thank you very much again, Michael. Uh, next, an uh, 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 old friend of mine from, from Boulder, Colorado, is Ora uh, Hagen, who's giving a paper on comparative effects of meteorological in-situ forcing in the Earth's upper atmosphere. Uh, she comes from a very distinguished family of scientists. Uh, Jeff Forbes uh, also is a co-author on this paper and uh, uh, a very important uh, person in Inca. So, order. Well, thanks very much. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to start off by acknowledging my co-authors uh, on this work, Astrid Mauta, who really makes my ability to do research, to continue to do research possible uh, while I'm doing administrative work, Ray Robel, Art Richman, um, 
MacArthur Jones, Mac is here. He's a, a student working with myself and uh, Jeff Forbes at the University of Colorado. Uh, I've long had an interest in trying to understand how the thermosphere ionosphere system is uh, affected by magnetospheric and uh, solar geomagnetic forcing, uh, as well as the impacts of the lower atmosphere on uh, the thermosphere ionosphere system. And during the past five years, uh, we've really had a wonderful opportunity to study the latter because we've been in a period of prolonged solar minimum, and the geomagnetic activity was also very quiet. So I'm going to highlight some of the um, results of uh, the studies that uh, we've been engaged in. Uh, I'm going to uh, focus on uh, solar atmospheric tides. Um, these are a special class of gravity waves that Michael just spoke about. They are global in scale, so they're impacted by the um, Coriolis effect in a profound way. Uh, I'm going to really limit myself uh, in the interest of time to talking about some numerical uh, experiments that we've conducted with two models. Uh, the global scale wave model is a simple linearized uh, two-dimensional uh, uh, wave and tide model. Uh, it extends from the ground through the thermosphere. And then I'm going to talk about uh, results from our uh, self-consistent first principles model that includes the chemistry, the energetics, and the dynamics of the atmosphere from about 30 kilometers up to 500 kilometers. Uh, so so um, we will use the global scale wave model as a lower boundary condition in the time GCM in order to account for uh, the tropospheric, of the waves that are excited in the troposphere. So for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, atmospheric tides, I wanted to take a minute to uh, tell you that uh, they are excited by the periodic uh, absorption of solar radiation throughout the atmosphere from the troposphere and the middle atmosphere and up into the thermosphere. They are global in scale as I mentioned and their periods are harmonics of a solar day. The migrating tides are, are primarily excited by the absorption of solar radiation and these propagate with the apparent motion of the sun from a ground-based observer's perspective. On the other hand, uh, latent heat release uh, in deep tropical clouds in the uh, troposphere uh, also excite uh, global scale tides. Um, these uh, tides don't necessarily uh, propagate with the apparent motion of the sun. They can uh, move faster or slower from the ground-based perspective. And they uh, affect the uh, the dynamo process in the ionosphere, but I'm probably not going to have a chance to speak to that today. Uh, I use a shorthand when I talk about these tidal components and uh, want to orient you that I will call the uh, westward uh, propagating a migrating diurnal tide the DW1. It's a lot easier and quicker to say. And uh, the uh, non-migrating tides, D stands for diurnal, uh, E or W is the propagation direction, and then the zonal wave number uh, will be the, the third um, uh, specification. I'm also going to talk about some planetary waves uh, with various wave numbers in the, when I highlight the results. So this animation gives you a sense gives you a sense of uh, what a westward propagating migrating tide looks like in the top panel versus the combined effects of all of the waves uh, uh, in the bottom panel. And you can see that that, uh, that uh, bottom um, animation really kind of emphasizes the um, distortions due to combining uh, 13 wave numbers of diurnal f frequency. Now, you can imagine that the waves, when they're generated in the troposphere and stratomesosphere, they're actually very small there, and they aren't important to uh, people who study those regions. But the components of those waves that propagate up into the upper atmosphere are growing in amplitude because of the increasingly rarefied atmosphere. And so when you get up to the mesopause region, which Michael spoke about a few minutes ago, 
these uh, perturbations are extremely large and they're ubiquitous and persistent and they're actually governing the dynamics of the region at these altitudes. That gives you a sense of uh, the variability um, of the orders of tens of meters per second in, in perturbations. And the diurnal components are, as you can see, largely confined to low and middle latitudes. Okay, here's the time GCM a schematic to let you know that we can f uh, force this model in a number of ways. Uh, we account for the magnetospheric forcing using observed proxies and then parameterize the um, uh, uh, solar radiation and the high latitude auroral and convective forcing. Uh, at the lower boundary, as I mentioned, we put in the GSWM climatologies for this set of numerical experiments I'm going to show you. These are going to be perpetual se September runs. Uh, and I'm going to show you uh, the results of two simulations, one for solar cycle minimum, where the in situ forcing of the thermosphere will be comparatively weak, and the other for solar maximum. And uh, there won't be any magnetic storm effects in these simulations. I hope you can see this figure. Uh, this, these are the amplitudes of the uh, non-migrating tides, migrating tides, and a planetary wave. Uh, over the equator from uh, 30 kilometers, uh, the model lower boundary, up to the uh, upper bound, near the upper boundary in the thermosphere. So here is the migrating tide. You remember I said that was excited throughout the atmosphere, and you see the very large uh, dominant response in the thermosphere due to the absorption of EUV. Here is the DE3. So this wave is excited by that latent heat release, uh, as I mentioned before. And you'll notice in the uh, mesopause region that it is the dominant diurnal response. It, it, sup it exceeds the magnitude of the migrating tide. <clears throat> There's also here a signature of a planetary wave four which is not forced in the model. This is generated self-consistently in the model. And by doing numerical uh, analysis and ex further experiments, we can uh, determine that this is, in fact, a child wave that is created by a nonlinear interaction between these two uh, dominant waves, the DE3 and the um, migrating tide. There's some semi-diurnal uh, components that I'm not going to discuss here. So you can see that. Uh, from this figure that the uh, lower atmospheric tides are propagating directly into the thermosphere. They have measurable amplitudes, and um, they're also generating secondary waves which are propagating into the thermospheres. Uh, this is uh, some uh, new work that Mac produced, uh, and what we've done here is We've taken the Earth's magnetic field as it's parameterized in the time GCM, and actually there's an offset between the uh, geographic and the geomagnetic poles uh, in the real uh, magnetosphere. Um, so that's represented by a model that we call IGRF in time GCM. So we did two simulations for solar max conditions. We ran the model uh, uh, with the IGRF, and then we reran it and aligned the dipole of the Earth with the geographic pole. And when we difference uh, the results that come from that, uh, those calculations, we generate, we can quantify rather what we would call pseudo tides. So these um, tidal components uh, look like something that might be migrating up from uh, the lower atmosphere if you were analyzing your model results, but they're actually generated in situ in the thermosphere due to coupling between the ionosphere thermosphere. Uh, we're going to uh, report now on another uh, series of calculations where, in addition to forcing the model with uh, GSWM for tides uh, at 30 kilometers, we also add uh, daily ECMWF um, uh, variables in order to uh, account for planetary waves that may be propagating up. Uh, and in this case, we're going to use realistic um, uh, values for uh, geomagnetic and uh, solar forcing. 
And this shows you, we're doing this for 2006. I'm showing you the first six months of the year. In the bottom panel, you see the, so, the variability of uh, solar forcing. Um, the proxy is the 10.7 centimeter solar radio flux. And this would be a solar minimum condition. This is probably moderate condition. So you can see in the early part of the year, we're really in a, in a the solar forcing is weak. On the top panel, KP3 would be quiescent magnetic forcing. KP6 would be moderate quiet, um, um, magnetic, uh, magnetospheric forcing. And again, in the uh, first month of the year, we have uh, no geomagnetic disturbances. So in fact, uh, when we look and diagnose this um, result, uh, I'm now just looking from January to March at the observed uh, temperature, I'm sorry, the modeled temperature at 71 degrees north and comparing, comparing it with some SABER diagnostics. You can see evidence of a, a sudden stratospheric warming in the model. Um, here we see the observations, you see the warming, the very disturbed middle atmosphere and then the recovery. And, uh, we do a good, I think, a good job of replicating that uh, in the model. Um, this is uh, not, while it's not an extremely uh, large sudden stratospheric warming, the recovery is, takes a long time, so it's prolonged. And we'd like to understand how the uh, non-migrating tides, et cetera, are impacted by that. So now I'm just looking January to March. Again, we ran the model twice, uh, no ECMWF, so there's no uh, stratospheric warming, no planetary wave disturbance on the left. Uh, and I'm looking at the zonal wind amplitudes here. And uh, then in this case, uh, we have the, the disturbance. And uh, at 110 kilometers, these non-migrating tides are being profoundly impacted by this planetary wave one, and in fact, the DE3 is interacting nonlinearly with the planetary wave one to create a second component of DE2 and therefore modulating the component that is coming up from the lower atmosphere. So we see a couple of effects here and you see the reduction in the DE3 due to that uh, cascade of energy going into the DE2. Uh, if I look at the lower thermosphere and the upper thermosphere, uh, uh, as a function of latitude uh, that you can see, again, as I mentioned before, the migrating component excited in situ, uh, very strong. If you look at the DE3, you can see that as a function of month, uh, some seasonal variability and a lot of variability due to uh, meteorological disturbances as a function of time. And finally, the DE2, which is a combination of a tropospheric source plus a wave tide interaction uh, is even more variable. Thank you very much. Uh, the ionosphere, I'll just talk about uh, briefly. If you look at the peak density over, uh, the, over Greenwich at a local noon, without any planetary wave forcing, you can see variability and that is correlated probably with some uh, moderate uh, um, geomagnetic activity. But when you add the planetary wave uh, forcing at the lower boundary, you can see uh, really pronounced uh, differences that are, that are due to the dynamically uh, driven um, uh, troposphere, mesosphere, thermosphere coupling. So let me just make a few points here. I think that I hope I've convinced you that the thermosphere ionosphere system is profoundly affected by uh, tropospheric clouds and meteorological disturbances. The tides and the planetary waves affect this region of the atmosphere in at least three ways that we know of. Direct penetration, then uh, generation of secondary waves, which in turn directly penetrate. And then finally, um, they do so by modulating the E-region dynamo. Um, and I didn't have a chance to talk about that today in the interest of time. And finally, uh, we are just beginning to explore how the differences between the geographic and the geomagnetic frames of reference that characterize the, the uh, dynamics of the um, neutral and plasma um, affect the, um, the, um, the diagnostics of the waves and planetary waves which we study. 
So I'm just going to thank you all for your attention, and I wanted to take a moment to talk about the people who have really um, impacted me um, in this work and in my 20-year career at um, NCAR. And so I'll let you read that and um, stop here. Thanks. <laughs>